Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 267, Andrew Davis on Church History, the Trinity, and Modalism, Part 2. In this second part of my conversation with Mr. Andrew Davis, we discuss why he initially dismissed biblical Unitarian theology and why he eventually came to give it a second look. Ultimately, he was persuaded to move from a so-called Arian-type theology to biblical Unitarian theology. We discuss what you have to believe to be saved according to the New Testament, how and why mainstream Christianity discourages thinking about the Trinity, and how Protestantism relates to earlier Catholic traditions on this topic. Here then, the rest of my conversation with Andrew Davis. So how did you go then from being a sort of latter-day Hamoyan to being what you are now, which I know is you're a biblical Unitarian? I became familiar with some of Sir Isaac Newton's writings. Um, he was basically an Arian or a Homoian. Um, again, him and Clark, actually, I think the, the Homoian label fits well because they were conceptually basically Arians in a lot of ways, but they weren't willing to wear the label um, and saw it as a mm-hmm. genuine error. You know, Again, I don't think it was just dishonesty. I think it was just genuinely an inconsistency. I became familiar with... Um, some of his writings and was going through some of them. And he makes a a strong case for this idea that uh, what you need to believe to be saved is pretty simple. It's just the rule of faith uh, that the early church talks about, uh, the basic baptismal creed, or the gospel. You know, really, just uh, basic faith in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, and in the Holy Spirit, and in the, the basic summary of the gospel there. And that there's not really a lot more beyond that that a person needs to believe to be saved and to be received into a church. Um, so I began to think through that. And, um, you know, I, I began to look at that in relation to literal pre existence and realize that literal pre existence just isn't part of the gospel. You know, there was really no way to defend that being part of the gospel. When I read through the book of Acts, you have Paul and Peter preaching the gospel again and mm. again and again. People believe it and they get saved. So whatever they, they preached was sufficient for a person to believe that and that, w- that would save them. You know, they were able to be baptized and to be received into the church as Christians without more than that. And preexistence is just never mentioned. And the same is true in the first three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. You know, there's just no real emphasis or mention of literal pre-existence. That's not part of the message that the apostles were preaching, that a person needed to believe uh, to be saved, to, to receive baptism. You know, um, the, the threshold for baptism, which was a person's reception into the church, was just believe the gospel they preached and repent and, and you're in. You know, and that, that gospel involved a human Jesus, but it didn't involve... Uh, any literal pre-existence. Um, so I became convinced that that wasn't part of the gospel. And I, I became rather concerned about adding to the gospel because Paul in Galatians says you're anathema if you add to the gospel. Um, this was part of what even led me to to want to become homoian rather than Nicene was realizing, look, I'm adding coessentiality to the gospel here. How far is that away from adding circumcision? You know, What's the difference between adding a doctrine and adding a work that the apostles didn't say was necessary? You know, how how different is that fundamentally? You're still adding something to what a person needs to believe to be saved or do to be saved. And so that, that led to a lot of my conservatism, but that also led me to realize, well, biblical Unitarians are Christians then. And previously I'd kind of discounted biblical Unitarianism uh, as really being a serious contender in my thinking, just because as a Nicene, you know, you look at anything that denies literal pre-existence, it's just sort of not on the radar. I mean, even the Arians acknowledge literal pre-existence. I mean, it's just, you know, nobody nobody can really take that seriously as sort of the attitude that a lot of the church fathers have towards that, and that was sort of my attitude as well. I'd also interacted with some biblical Unitarians who, who didn't always have great arguments for their position, and uh, there wasn't anything that had really made jump out to me. Mm-hmm. So I, I discounted it, and I discounted Biblical Unitarians as, as not being Christians because of that, and I realized I'd made a pretty bad mistake because, you know, I was adding to the gospel. It was me who was in danger, if anything. You know, how can I say these people are in danger for rejecting pre-existence when, you know, in fact, the Bible says I, I'm in danger for adding to the gospel. So, 
that was concerning to me, and that, that led me to uh, really be willing to look at biblical Unitarianism. And so I said, okay, well, biblical Unitarians are brothers in Christ then. You know, we believe Unitarianism together. We, we all believe that the one God is one person, the Father. Uh, we don't agree on literal preexistence, but maybe I, can, uh, maybe I can write some stuff for my website that will help persuade some of them over to, to my side of things. And so I'll, I'll listen to some of their arguments and refute them. So I, uh, I got a hold of your video on YouTube, your case against uh, pre-existence, thinking that this would be easily mm-hmm. refuted, and that turned out to not be the case. <laughs> Hence, I'm here. Um, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so well, That's interesting. What did you find compelling about the case? Okay, so after that, I really inundated myself with a lot of arguments from biblical Unitarians. So it is a little hard for me mentally to remember which arguments come from that video in particular and which come from from Mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, But I do remember one thing that you said was uh, you hit on the the fact that Jesus is a descendant of David, I think, and the descendant of Abraham. And you just got into like, you know, what is the normal common sense understanding of a descendant? You know, Mm -hmm. ordinarily that entails causation, you know, that that a descendant is actually caused by the person they're a descendant of. Um, well, of course, that doesn't mm-hmm. really work with literal pre-existence, because if Jesus uh, takes his existence from those who he's descended from, then that means that he didn't pre-exist David and Mary. He, he came to exist from Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, so, basically, mm-hmm. it, it just, that was, the, that was where the can of worms got opened, and I realized there's a real case here that I need to look into seriously. I mean, there's a lot of arguments from the New Testament um, for biblical Unitarianism, and I mean, there's, there's exegetical and philosophical arguments, and I, I really just tried to soak up a lot of uh, information and really became inundated with info and sort of got in this place where I was pretty confused, you know, um, and said, I just need to slow down and, f- and kind of figure out what are the win conditions for each side here? What do I need to see from the Bible to know that Arianism is the right choice? What do I need to see from the Bible to know that that the Socinian or Biblical Unitarian Christology is the right choice. Mm -hmm. And so, I got to thinking about it and said, well, you know, when you really get down to it, the Biblical Unitarian position is actually the more conservative position. And this was kind of a revelation for me because I always thought of Nicaea as kind of the the conservative starting line and everything uh, diverges from that Mm. into more and more liberal views or more and more divergent views. Um, But really, when you get down to it from a Biblical standpoint, I think Biblical Unitarianism is hands down the most conservative because everything that the biblical Unitarian position affirms about Jesus and about the Father is fairly clear in the Bible. There's really mm. not much room, in my opinion at least, for disputing, you know, Jesus as a man and his life and death and burial and resurrection, his kingdom, you know, uh, the virgin birth. You know, those things are, are fairly straightforward, you know, if you just accept the Bible as it is, whereas literal preexistence is something on top of that. So, I said, okay, well, then the burden of proof is going to lie on the Arian position, you know, because I know that everything that the biblical Unitarians affirm is true. The question is just, is this additional doctrine also true? And so, what I needed to see then, I determined, was I needed to see some passage in the Bible that would prove that Jesus literally pre-existed, that it was more than just a possible reading, but actually really the necessary way of taking what was said. And so, that Mm -hmm. led me to scour the Bible, and I got through the Old Testament fairly quick and realized that there wasn't the support there that I thought there was. I thought I had a a really great exegetical case for literal preexistence when I was Homoian and and Nicene, uh, you know, the angel of the Lord and Paul's statements and the Gospel of John. And then uh, I read an article by Troy Salinger about the angel of the Lord, um, and that really demolished my position there and made me realize, wow, you know, just on a a purely exegetical level, there's really no reason to even think that it's the same angel who's always called the angel of the Lord, let alone that it's pre-existent Jesus. That took a big chunk Mm -hmm. out of my my position there. And Mm. just really, my position just got whittled down to the point where, you know, I had a handful of texts in John, finally, that I said, you know, if, if anywhere that I can see in the Bible proves pre-existence, it's going to be one of these, and I uh, went through those pretty carefully and spent some time going through them, and just, you know, I, I really do believe that there's a, a reasonable and plausible alternative interpretation for every one of these passages that's alleged in proof of pre-existence. And, of course, if that's the case, then none of them prove literal pre-existence, uh, even if that remains a possibility, which I do think that there, there's maybe one form of it that could still be possible. But, you know, if it can't be proven, then I want to stick to what I know. Um, I want to stick to what's clear from the Bible, not, not just a lot of speculation that, you know, theoretically it could be this or that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that biblical Unitarian is the more conservative position. 
I completely agree, but it took me a long time to come around to that. When you just look at the numbers, you say, oh, what's these people's deal? They must have some idiosyncratic methodology. You know, they're rationalists or something. Like, why would they be out there just denying what everybody else thinks is really obvious? Well, there's got to be some explanation. They must be liberals in disguise or something. I don't know what it is, but... But then you realize, yeah, biblical Unitarians, for different reasons, have learned to be skeptical about some of these flights of speculation. And that's really kind of the main motive. (laughs) It's respect for the Bible as divine revelation and then skepticism about some of these interpretations and, um, you know, some of these traditional leaps. Like, just to take a really low piece of low-hanging fruit... I heard a well-known minister the other day, like a household name kind of pastor, uh, appeal to, I and the Father are one. And see, that just shows you Jesus is God. Wow. I mean, <laughs> that's that's lazy, number one. <laughs> right. And if he looked into it, he would find the church fathers reaming this interpretation. But if he just, if he looked at the context, he would see it didn't make any sense either, the author's not collapsing God and Jesus into one being. He's just saying they're about the same business, basically. Right. Paul says the one who plants and the one who sows are one. Yeah. But yeah, conservative. Um, when I first started to look into these things back in the early 2000s, um, I had read some really smart Christian philosophers trying to parse out the Trinity in, in different ways, trying to make sense of it, trying to show how it's consistent with itself and how it really counts as monotheism and... I wrote a paper, the first paper I wrote on the topic, it eventually was published as The Unfinished Business of Trinitarian Theorizing. And uh, I was stuck at the Nicene stage at that point. Uh, Like, well, maybe Nicaea, because it doesn't have this triune God, it doesn't have absolutely equal persons. Maybe that'll work. But the paper just kind of went, well, if you interpret the Trinity this way, hmm, that runs into a problem, a conceptual problem. And if you interpret the Trinity this way, uh, there's this other conceptual or biblical problem. And hmm, what are we going to do? We don't want to just say it's a mystery and just wave our hands, right? So, I mean, it was this honest exploring paper. At the time, I was kind of assuming maybe Clark had it right or something and he could be Nicene. But um, the response I got from a couple of well-known Christian philosophers was like, well, who do you think you are? How dare you question these things like the Athanasian Creed? And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm anybody. I'm just this guy trying to <laughs> yeah, trying to make sense of the Bible, you know? And I just, I want to discuss these things. Like, I don't think I'm smarter than everybody. That's not why I'm discussing it. I don't think I have some super duper spiritual insight or that I'm, you know, better than all these people. It's just, it's, gee, is this really what the Bible's saying? Is that such a terrible thing? But it wasn't cool. It was it was something that, you know, shouldn't be talked about, especially publicly. Yeah. No, it's amazing, the attitude that, that people will often have. Um, I found that there's a lot of assuming ill motives in my experience, where it's just wanting to know the truth and, and just trying to understand and explore things. And it's often met with, you know, you must be a really impious person to question this, you know. It's really strange how much of that Athanasian spirit comes through. Yeah, you know, you're assaulting Christ and you're, you must hate God and, you know, you're a rat and a snake and a low down dirty dog and a rationalist, blah, blah, blah. There's always, you know, it's, it's like poisoning the well fallacy. It's like, don't listen to that guy. He's a terrible guy. Yeah. It's very strange. We don't do this on other topics. You know, for instance, um, say there's somebody in your church that's, uh, like, hey, guys, maybe universalism is true. I don't think it is, but I mean, he's not going to be told to shut up. He's not going to be pilloried as a cult infiltrator Mm -hmm. or just some kind of terrible guy because he's wondering, hey, maybe universalism makes the most sense. Like, But on this topic, man, on this topic, you you just better watch your back because people will turn on you really fast. So often, anybody who rejects the Trinity is kind of marked as being a cultist, or groups that reject the Trinity are marked as being cults, I think, without without basis in many instances. Mm -hmm. What I noticed, though, is that it's really kind of the the cult-like attitude, the attitude that says, hey, you can't talk to anybody about this, you know, don't talk about it, don't think about it, don't question what we teach you. I found that more in evangelicalism with the Trinity than I have among anybody who rejects the Trinity. 
I've never experienced a biblical Unitarian or an Arian telling me I shouldn't ask questions, I shouldn't talk to people who disagree, I shouldn't think about it. That no, you know, none mm-hmm. of these people tell me, hey, these are dangerous questions to be asking. You know, what are you doing, or or would impugn my motives for it. Uh, it's the Trinitarians who who have that attitude of, hey, don't talk to the, anybody who doesn't believe this. You know, you don't even question it. Don't don't think too much about it. It's dangerous. And and when you really stop and think about it, I would question which of those is the more cult like attitude. You know, the one that says, hey, we're open mm. to. You know, compare our view with your view all you want, or the one that says, hey, you can't listen to anybody who disagrees. It's dangerous. Which of those is more cult-like? That's interesting. Yeah. No, it's it's hard to disagree with that. There's always been a hierarchical thing going on with this topic. You know what I realized? I, I had read all the 4th century stuff, and I had also read a bunch of Origen and Tertullian and others. After a lot of reading, I finally realized that there was a gigantic change in the 4th century, and it wasn't just theological, but it was ecclesial and sociological. The bishops basically seized the power of determining and even discussing these theological questions, at least on this topic. Mm-hmm. Right, so maybe you could still have a friendly conversation about, you know, what about those who never heard, or something like that, or other fine points of ecclesiology and theology. But this, no, I mean, this is for the elites to decide and for the elites to discuss, and you had better just keep your head down and go along with it. Sure. What's weird is that this survived more or less untouched into Protestantism. Yes. And you don't have bishops, but you do have a bishop-like class of theologically educated people, pastors and presbyters and other people in leadership positions, and they do close ranks. There's a real script here, like you're supposed to close ranks and throw the person out when they keep asking questions, you know, whereas you wouldn't on other... uh, If someone's in uh, some grievous moral sin, if I ditch my wife and run off with the secretary and I still want to come to church, there's going to be a problem with that, and rightly so. But yeah, this is treated almost kind of like that. (laughs) Yeah, But what's so weird is it's theoretical, you know, it's in the sense that it's trying to take a systematic look at the text and make the most sense of it. And I mean, how can you begrudge a person the right to work through this and to go through different stages and in, in what their commitments are? I don't see how you can. It's especially a travesty, I think, with Protestantism, you know, with, with Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism, you really can't charge them for being inconsistent with that sort of attitude. I think it. I don't think it makes it any mm-hmm. better, but it's certainly not inconsistent with sort of where they stand on things. And they're right up front with their way of handling that. But with Protestantism, like you said, the same attitude gets carried over, and it just doesn't make any sense in terms of consistency. Uh, I was in a Reformed Presbyterian church, and like I said, it was very conservative, you know. And so, part of the Westminster Confession that most Presbyterians don't hold to nowadays, they did, is formally confessing that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist. Not just an Antichrist, but mm. the Antichrist. And yet, mm-hmm. at the same time, a lot of people in these circles are very, very zealous for, like, Thomistic and scholastic classical theism and and medieval Trinitarian thoughts. So, like, the Fourth Lateran Council on the Trinity is just a really big deal for them, which is one that's it's more semi-modalistic, I would suggest, you know, where, where it really solidifies... Wait. Wait, wait, they like the Fourth Lateran Council on the Trinity? They love it. It's it's very essential, and oh. you're in danger if you go against it, so I've, I've been told. Um, wow. Which is shocking, right? Wow, that... Well, it is. It is not only for the Trinity part, but, I mean, the Fourth Lateran Council is like the mother load of embarrassing council decisions. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough to make any person, any modern person, dislike councils in general, I mean. Sure, well... You know... I'm, all the stuff about the Jews have to wear a star and mm. can't uh, associate with the Christians and they need to shut up, not make fun of our holy days. And uh, I mean, it goes on and on. Well, and that's where transubstantiation really gets uh, formally put into writing as well. So, you know, mainstream Protestantism mm-hmm. is not able to accept that council on the whole by a long shot. Papal authority is very strong there as well. So I just, I think it's so inconsistent when you have a situation where, and this wasn't peculiar to just Presbyterianism at the outset of the Reformation. Protestantism, by and large, in the early years, it was a a fairly common belief among different branches of Protestantism that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist. And yet, Mm. 
pretty much across the board, they were willing to accept Roman Catholicism's Trinitarianism, defined by these medieval councils like the Fourth Lateran Council. And it just seems so strange because, you know, you, you look at their position, they say, well, we think that the Pope of Rome corrupted the church's worship, corrupted the church's soteriology, corrupted this and that and the other. But the Pope of Rome took the Trinity from the church fathers and kind of polished it up and added to it and improved it, and now we've got that from them. You know, it's a very hmm. odd attitude to have, um, because there really was no attitude of going back to the 4th century fathers for the Trinity, like there was with other things, I think, in the Reformation. To be fair to Protestantism, I mean, there's a great range here. To me, it seems like sometimes the Reformed people are kind of like Catholic light, mm -hmm. you know? They're, oh, definitely. They're very, very small C Catholic, although any kind of Protestants can, especially with theological seminary education, they can move to be more Catholic. But anyway, um, I mean, some historians call that the magisterial wing of the Reformation. Right. They still have that, well, we have this elite and we're going to tell you how, how things really are. And we're going to talk about the priesthood of believers, but anyway, you're the kind of priest that doesn't get to talk about these things. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, I guess there's different classes, but other Protestants are so Bible oriented that they kind of well, they're not as interested in the fine distinctions and in the theological arguments. They're just not as programmed to be like kind of little partisan Nicenes. The churches I grew up in, the only people that were like really partisan Nicenes were like, you know, the seminary graduates, which was like 1% or maybe 3%. I don't know. And everybody else, yeah, they were more laid back, you know. You're not sure about this Trinity thing? Oh, oh man, I'm not either. I mean, gosh, how can you make sense of something like that? So, huh. I mean, they weren't on the warpath to go find some kindling and tie you to his stake as soon as, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking. But yeah, I mean, the more Bible-oriented they are, the less they, they care about some of these disputes, in my experience. But there, there still can be a hierarchy. It depends on the church culture. You know, the pastor may still be the person who has the final say and who's going to tell you what to think and when to stop asking questions. Or maybe not. It just it depends on, the, on the, the people involved, it seems to me. Sure. Yeah. It varies from church to church a lot, too, I think. The churches that I was in have tended to be more theologically inclined. I think the average person is somewhat theologically educated more so than maybe the average evangelical church. And so I think that led to, to my experience being that a lot of people weren't very tolerant of divergence on the Trinity. Like what you described was not my, my experience at all, even with a lot of lay people. Just the general mm -hmm. attitude was, mm -hmm. you know, you're basically really dangerous and you're basically a cult member if you're questioning the Trinity. My now wife was told to not talk to me because I was dangerous. I believe what the JWs believed, uh, supposedly. I, I didn't even wasn't even familiar with what the JWs believed, but this was back when I was looking into Justin Martyr. Uh, she was told she shouldn't talk to me because I would be a danger to her. <laughs> uh -huh. That was just the attitude that a uh -huh. lot of people had, I think, was just, you know, this is really dangerous. Don't talk to them. And even if they're not zealous to figuratively burn you at the stake, they're not chill with it. When the Trinity's podcast returns... We discuss Mr. Davis's debt to the famous early writer Justin Martyr, and we also discuss why I call people like Mr. Davis whistleblowers. the interesting thing i think with our current situation there's for a long time been a hierarchical aspect to all of this and the ruling class is much stricter and is going to crack down on you if you're going to start raising questions but the system depends on there being limited information i think there's a lot of things that are discussed in seminary that are never discussed from the pulpit even a lot of these Nicene disputes are hardly ever discussed, or just the fact that all the early church fathers are either subordinationist or they're modalists. Haven't Christians always been Trinitarian? You know, mm, yeah. this mean guy Arius messed it up, but we said no to him, and thank goodness we did that. But now that information is so easy to get, I don't think the system can continue forever. It's going to have to change. 
a lot more people, I think, are going to see this as a compelling case. I mean, look at you. You had, you had every motivation to not go down this path, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were trying to figure out, you know, does the Bible make sense about God and Jesus? Yeah. And uh, it wasn't because the JWs or the Mormons had got hold of you. They hadn't. No, not at all. I owe the church fathers a tremendous debt, really. I mean, that's really what was was one of the biggest things for me. I mean, I wouldn't be a Unitarian if it hadn't been for Justin Martyr. Mm. Just starting me down the path, and then really it was it was mostly seeing it from the Church Fathers. Samuel Clark also helped, but there was no mm-hmm. like interaction with JWs or, or anything like that that, that mm-hmm. really contributed to my mm-hmm. my views when I was more Arian or Logos theorist. And uh, you're what I call a whistleblower. You were a total insider to the Trinitarian systems, and now you're like, hey guys, this this doesn't make sense. As long as people can cast you as an outsider, they're like, yeah, don't listen to that guy. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it, right? It's interesting when I listen to evangelical apologists like William Lane Craig, they almost can't bring up an objection to the Trinity unless they cast it as a Muslim objection or maybe a cultist objection, right? We know these guys don't get it. Obviously, they don't even understand what they're criticizing. Then it's safe to discuss once they do that. (laughs) They have to make it, you know, like an outsider attack. But uh, look, I mean, who cares what the outsider thinks if he doesn't really understand it, right? It is true. A lot of Muslim debaters, they hardly have looked into the Trinity much. They just think it's straightforward tritheism and they don't really understand the lingo and the history. And so you can waste a lot of time just sort of correcting their terminological or historical mistakes and so on. But It makes people wonder more when somebody's been a full-fledged card-carrying member of the system, and then they basically just study their way out of it. They find something that just makes more sense. And they didn't get there by discounting the Bible. Like, to the contrary, they were taking it all the more seriously. Absolutely. I feel like I understand so much of the Bible better now than I did when I held any other view, you know. Uh, the Nicene view, the Arian view, the Trinitarian view, there's just so many passages that make more sense, and it's really nice to not have to feel the need to explain things away. Even if it's not fully explaining stuff away, when you're a Trinitarian, you just have to qualify stuff so much, you know. You don't completely reject Jesus saying the Father's greater than I, but it's going to have like this mm-hmm. giant asterisk next to it, you know. Or, um, you know, no one knows the day or the hour except for the Father. You know, another giant asterisk, you know, and there's got to be, you know, a significant amount of, of commentary on that, of, lest you get the wrong idea there. Or even just Jesus being a man. Yeah, well, sometimes they'll slip up and say he's not a man, but there's a lot of hand-waving, right? You say, well, day or the hour, uh, two natures, you know? Oh, yeah. How could God die? Uh, two natures? Like, you're supposed to say, well, once you just have the two natures, you'll understand how this works. But goodness sakes, like, you have to keep asking questions because arguably the two natures speculations don't help. They just introduce more problems. Take the dying one. You're supposed to maybe say something like, well, he died with respect to his human nature, but he didn't die with respect to his divine nature. And then you're supposed to say it's one person and two natures. Okay, so you got one person who died and didn't die. (laughs) How did this help? Yeah. You know? Okay, no, no. It's not one the same guy dying and not dying at the same time. We're not saying that. How about this? The divine nature was still living and the human nature died. Okay, so now you got two different things. One of them lives and one of them dies. Right. That makes sense. But now you got two selves in there. And it looks like the human nature is now a human person. you got an origin Christology, the like origin of Alexandria. You've got this man, and then you've got this eternal divine logos. I mean, talk about exegetical disaster. I mean, that's just, that's terrible. Absolutely. A lot of it just ends up quasi-Nestorian, I think, you know, where a lot of the explanations, when you really look hard at them, it's just all of a sudden there's really two Jesuses in the picture now. One died, one didn't, one knew, one didn't, you know, one's equal with the Father, one's greater. It's never put that bluntly, but that's sort of where it ends up going in in many instances, I think. Yeah, I think that might have been more popular back in ancient times than, than it is now, but the thing I've noticed about the Bible and the Trinity more recently is... I realized that when I was a Trinitarian, even though I thought I was being conservative and sticking to the Bible, that's what I would tell myself. But really, I was kind of being condescending to the Bible. It was like, well, I know what you guys are trying to say, 
but you're not smart enough to have all these sophisticated concepts and terminology like we have now, now that we're so much more advanced, you know, it's like you're trying to crawl your way. You're trying to claw your way towards Trinitarianism and towards full blown two natures, Christology. So I'm really kind of looking down on the Bible, like, oh, you guys need help. Like you're so primitive, you know, I'll tell you what you're trying to say. You're trying to say this. Now, now I just think it makes sense. Like, I feel like I've got into their heads and I don't think they're heavily beset with problems and trying to figure things out, you know? Yeah. It's more uh, charitable, I guess is what I'm saying. It actually takes New Testament theology seriously as something that actually stands on its own. It doesn't need Athanasius to come along and tell us what a true son is <laughs> or to instruct us on generation and procession. No, I mean, they thought the one God was the Father. That, that's a long-standing view. It's just monotheism. And then you got this man who is of miraculous origin. And then you got God's Spirit. Yeah. I mean, the thing that slowed me down figuring it out was I had to try out all the philosophical angles first. It slowed me way down. But the thing that helped me about my academic background was I had got used to sort of working my way into somebody's head who had like a really different view, like from a different time and place. Like if I'm trying to read, you know, early medieval Neoplatonist or something, like you have to kind of crawl inside their brain and inside their outlook and their language and kind of realize how they're using terms and so on. Right. And it doesn't matter what later people tell you they must have been up to. You have to get in there and sort of see how it makes sense from their perspective. Right. I was literally told that this is what you have to do. You can't trust what Thomas Aquinas says about Aristotle, because there's this enormous gap of spatial and temporal distance there and cultural difference. Of course, Aquinas isn't going to be your best expert on Aristotle. You go to the Aristotle experts. Right. You need to figure out what it meant to Aristotle. So when I started to do this to the New Testament, all heaven broke loose, basically, in my theology. I started realizing that just, you know, the kind of classic uh, apologist case just kind of fell apart pretty easily. But pre-existence, that took me a lot longer to figure out what I thought about those passages. At least for me, I, I didn't think that coming to Unitarianism was too difficult, especially when I had kind of started out there before going Trinitarian. You know, it was a, it was a mm -hmm. big conceptual shift. I mean, it really is. I mean, just the way that you view God, going from viewing God as a triune being to viewing him as, you know, a, a, a unipersonal being is a pretty big shift, but, you know, there's such a good biblical case for it, and there's so many problems with the alternative that that, that part was not as difficult. For me, the, uh, the Christology was what really took a long time and a lot of effort, and uh, that was where the real journey was. I mean, really, I was Unitarian from the time that I, I discovered Justin and was Nicene onward, but the, the biblical Unitarian part of it, the Socinian Christology, that was what really took a while. Mm -hmm. And th there was a lot to work through there. Yeah, my experience was basically the same. The Holy Spirit, I found a harder issue as well. Of course, it depends. Some people are more committed to the triune God idea. Like that that's just, you know, God's imperfect in love or he's lonely or something if he's not tripersonal. If God's not tripersonal, the Muslims would be right. Why not just become a Muslim? Like some people are really invested in the triune God per se. But then again, a lot of us, once we realize that that idea just isn't there, we're like, oh, thank goodness, this makes sense, you know? Yeah. <laughs> of course the one God's the Father. Like, Paul says it at the start of every one of his letters. <laughs> that was really where the church fathers were just so valuable for me, too, because I, I was fairly committed to the tripersonal God thing. If it had been somebody in the modern day trying to show me from the Bible, I really don't know that I would have taken it very well or if I would have accepted it. But realizing that this was the more ancient view was very impactful for me, and it forced me to look at the Bible more honestly than maybe I would have if it was just somebody today saying it. Because you know, I, I went That's through interesting. all the church fathers. I, I mean, I like scoured, I, did, I, I would like search the volumes of them, you know, for the phrases one God and similar phrases and stuff to see what they said and, and try to just see what all of them said, you know, do they ever use this for the Son or is it always the Father? And, it's, you know, basically across the board, the only people who say it, it belongs to the Son are, are the modalists. Like, modalists would say, mm -hmm. you know, the one God is, is the Father and the Son. But all of the yeah. the the, pro, the proto orthodox fathers. I mean, it's just it's the first article of the faith for them. Uh, that's what Irenaeus calls it in demonstration of the apostolic preaching. Is the uh, the first article of the faith is w belief in one God, 
the Father Almighty, the maker of all things, you know, and that's just ubiquitous. And so, for me, reading the patristics, it's like, there is no view of a tripersonal God there. You know, if, if that view of God doesn't mm-hmm. exist for several centuries un- until after Christ uh, ascended, then you, you know, it just becomes really, really impossible to ignore. Forced me to look at the Bible a lot more. And, and you know, these church fathers quote the Bible, too. I mean, you know, they, they'll ground their confession in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and you know, uh, you know, John seventeen three. I mean, those are, you know, th- this wasn't just all tradition based. You know, they go to the Bible as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was helpful to me to see the church fathers saying that. I had been told by apologists that the deity of Christ was the heart of it all, and that you know, all the early guys believe in the deity of Christ. And look, we got this little list of quotations that that apologists like to break out, Catholic and Protestant. It's basically the same list. You know, half of it's uh, Ignatius. <laughs> but you know when you actually when you actually read them then you realize well they do call Jesus God and our God or a God or the second God or another God yeah but then when they actually are talking about monotheism it's the father right whenever the subject of the one god comes up it's the father and then you realize oh they're just using language a little more they're using God terminology more loosely than we tend to nowadays. Sure. And a lot of it's drawn from Platonism, another contemporary philosophy, mm-hmm. I think, as well. This was something that was really kind of concerning for me when I was Homoian, was realizing I was debating with people, and somebody pointed out to me that Plotinus speaks in a very, very similar way about God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know, that was it was pretty disconcerting to start to realize that, hey, a lot of these... A lot of these Neoplatonists, their views and like the Christology of the Logos theorists are really similar. And a lot of the terminology is really similar. That was one of the things. Yeah, they had heavenly triads as well. That's true. Right. They had the heavenly triads first. Right. People like right. Numenius. Mm-hmm. That was really concerning to me. Uh, that was one of the things that was helpful in getting me motivated to look into biblical Unitarianism was realizing, hey, you know, mm-hmm. it's really not impossible that this is a, a, a foreign influence. Yeah, because one of the things, too, that, that made me not look into it sooner is, you know, the, the pre-existent Christology really does go back fairly early. Justin Martyrs, fairly early. You can trace it back, and if you accept the Ignatian epistles mm-hmm. especially, then you can see pre-existence going back fairly early. But it was realizing that, you know, to what extent this could very well be an influence from outside of Christianity was, was pretty impactful to me, and especially with Justin. I love Justin. Um, I have great respect for Justin. I mean, he's brilliant, and he's got a lot of great stuff to say, but it, it's not very hard to see how he might have blended Platonism with the Bible. Um, I mean, he was a former Platonist. He had great respect for Plato. He, you know, it's it's not very surprising for somebody very well intended, I think, to go to the Bible and come at it with this outlook of, you know, there's this Logos that's a mediator between God and the universe, and you see the angel of the Lord being a mediator between God and the universe, and you're like, oh, there's the Logos, you know? Yeah. I mean, he thought that Plato got his idea of forms from Moses. Yeah, you know, that was his whole theory. It was yeah. That, he so liked Plato that he, rather than consciously being syncretistic with Plato, he adopted a lot out of Platonism in the name of saying that it all originated from the Old Testament mm-hmm, rather than mm-hmm. something outside of the Bible. Yeah, I mean, these views um, are considered crazy by scholars today, but you know, the thing that shocked me about <laughs> Justin Martyr was yeah. toward the end of uh, the dialogue with Trifo, he basically says, I'm paraphrasing that, uh, look, nobody thinks that the father of all could come down to earth and do stuff, you know. I realized that he thought that it was just obvious that God couldn't create directly and that he had picked this up from Plato's Timaeus because Plato has this speculative cosmology where there's the ultimate source, but then there's this craftsman guy who is neither created nor uncreated. He kind of stands in between and you're like, oh, okay, I see where these Platonist sympathizers get that now. Right. But it's crazy. Why would you think an all-powerful being can't just create on his own? I mean, how could you be all powerful and have to use an intermediary? Yeah, absolutely. It disturbed me more also when I realized that in the fourth century they forgot about this concern. They actually mock people who think that God can't create directly. This is how you started down this path, but it, <laughs> right. it gets forgotten later on. No, it's very ironic when you really think about it. I mean, the, the Logos theorists 
are the reason that the triune God doctrine develops. I mean, it wouldn't have developed if they hadn't come first and laid the groundwork of literal pre-existence, especially people like Origen with eternal generation and sort of just gradually getting a higher and higher Christology. Like, the triune God view just wouldn't have it wouldn't have come up if it hadn't been for that. But then they get labeled Arians and, and sort of get betrayed in the fourth century. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're the reason why it all exists. And you're even having these debates, but then they're the heretics. Yeah. So. Origen gets, you know, figuratively speaking, he gets dug out of the grave and burned at the stake posthumously um, <laughs> later on. Right. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Mr. Davis and I discuss the influence of Greek philosophy and specifically Platonism on the development of Christian theology. And he also gives some advice to Christians who are just starting to think about this issue of Trinity theories. Some of my biblical Unitarian friends would strongly disagree with me about this, but they take the view that couldn't you just keep philosophy and theology totally separate? Why did you have to corrupt pure Hebrew thinking with all this Greek junk, all these foreign elements? And my own view is if you had more philosophy in early Christianity, you could have kept the Platonists in their place. You would have had people to push back on all this speculation. As it stood, and this is just my crazy little opinion, as it stood, too many people stood aside and just let the platonic enthusiasts carry the day in terms of philosophical underpinning. So I've never been a big fan of Platonism. I see a lot of sloppiness and a lot of woolly-headedness. Like if I'm reading ancient philosophy, I'm more a fan of Stoics and Epicureans and and Aristotle and the Platonists, yeah, I mean, they're always they're always saying some pretty bizarre things on a lot of topics, and uh, their arguments, like I said, are kind of they tend towards being sloppy. You see this in Justin and Origen. You know, Origen's a better arguer than Justin, but still, sometimes he makes this argument, and you're like, really? Like you think that's a compelling argument? Yeah, I don't know. I I think maybe the mainstream was let down by neglecting what was really an unavoidable topic. I mean. Everybody was Hellenized to some extent in this time. They'd had centuries of influence. There wasn't no pure Hebrew thinking that wasn't touched in any way by Greek tradition. But they could have done better, sure. I thought, if they hadn't uh, just... So, I mean, take Origen. I kind of like Origen in the sense that he's obviously a very smart guy, and he did some really amazing things, you know. He basically invented textual criticism, comparing yeah. different versions of the Old Testament. I mean, that's a, that's an astounding achievement. I mean, he should be famous for that if that was the only thing he did. But, I mean, looking at the way they interacted with him in the 230s, 240s, until he died in the 250s, I think they were a little bit sort of idolatrous. Like, they kind of sucked up to him and thought he was some kind of great sage. And, like, to me, he's just a philosopher. I know the type. <laughs> you know? And they're useful, I don't mean to disrespect, it's just another type of person, but you shouldn't treat them like they can just sit there and answer all your doctrinal questions for you. That's kind of what they did with him, and that, but that tells me there weren't enough people around with similar competence, similar training, that they kind of glommed on to guys like him. Augustine, you know, seems to have been the smartest guy around in his time. Uh, you know, they, they basically forcibly made him be a bishop. And um, he got to be pretty know-it-all in a lot of things that he thought. I don't think it's good to be the smartest guy around. I didn't want to be. That's why I went to grad school, you know? (laughs) And I was just one of many similar people, not anywhere close to the top. So, I don't know. I don't see how you avoid philosophy, A. B, I don't think there was any pure, untinged Hebrew thinking at that point. And I don't think you should equate philosophy with the kind of sloppy thinking Platonism that tended to carry the day back then that a lot of educated people were into. 
I would also point out that there were some people who may have been more philosophically educated who were championing a biblical Unitarian view in the early church as well. They get so forgotten, but there was Theodotus and Photinus and others who were teachers, and they wrote, and they they taught, and they were very influential in their time. In fact, Origen and Tertullian and Justin seem to admit that the majority of average Christians were basically biblical Unitarians. Seemingly, they didn't believe Mm pre-existence. But this just gets so Mm -hmm. forgotten, because we don't have anything preserved from them. So, totally forgotten by most people. Yep. You have a nice blog post on that where you give those, those relevant quotations that you just referred to. But yeah, they're entered into a mainstream, this tradition of mocking people who give precise arguments or who are not impressed with this, some of these woolly-headed platonic themes. You know, God is unnameable and things like this. Some of the Arians, but also some of the earlier people, they had read not just people similar to Plotinus or Numenius, but they had read, you know, some Aristotelians or Galen or some of the Stoics who kind of were better at putting an argument together. But yeah, they, this this gets uh, pilloried as rationalistic logic chopping and just sort of somehow point missing, but it's not point missing. If you put together precise arguments, this is a mark of being interested in the truth. And you're saying something that's specific enough to be refuted. So it's humble. It's not proud. You're sticking your neck out and you're saying, well, hey, what about, how about this? Okay, well, because you were so clear, someone can come along and say, well, premise three is false and I'll tell you why. That's more humble than just kind of being a big grandstanding guy who doesn't have precise arguments. It's also worth keeping in mind with a lot of that history that it, it wasn't even so much argumentation that won the day for the Logos theorists and for the Trinitarians, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's, and you, you're, you're well familiar with this. I mean, it really, it, it becomes a matter of tradition and then mm-hmm. becomes a matter of state authority, you know? Mm-hmm. It's so interesting to wonder, you know, if the fourth century hadn't seen, like, the conversion of Constantine, how different might things have developed? I mean, imagine if Photinus hadn't been stopped by the state, you know? Um, how different things may have developed on their own, you know. Um, I think it would really be a lot different than what we've seen in history if the state's power hadn't been behind Trinitarianism. Yeah, but even before the state got behind it, you know, they had become, in a lot of circles, in my opinion, kind of idolatrous in how they treated people like Origen, you know, as if he was, you know, the 13th apostle or something. They were just so bowled over by his learnedness that they stopped treating it just like, hey, here's another guy with his own with his own speculation, which is how he expected to be treated. He would say, well, you know, I might be off base about this, or hey, I'm going to speculate here for a couple of minutes, so please excuse me. He didn't think everything that came out of his mouth was a pearl of wisdom that should be adored and put in a museum. But then you see people a couple generations on, you know, kind of idolizing him and as this great, uh, this great guy, which I think is a sign of unhealthiness. It was that development of tradition and a very Catholic, it's that same Catholic yeah. attitude of, of wanting to, to stick to those who came before. And, you know, I also think, you know, like you said, he was brilliant. And I think people were really happy to have people who could be good apologists. You know, we look at so much of Origen and some of these fathers today, and it's just like, kind of bizarre, some of the things that they say. But they were speaking to the Platonists of their day. I mean, they were really speaking to the, the predominant philosophy. And I think my guess is that people really love that, that they were able to address them in their own terms and, and probably be very successful philosophically. Yeah, at least if you were in that elite class, you know, who had read certain literature, right? you might find someone like Origen very helpful. If you had just read... Uh, mm-hmm. Kelsus's work against the Christians, and then Origen comes along and takes him on point by point. You know, that took a lot of work. That's not where most people would have been coming from, but can't begrudge him trying to make sense of it the best he can with the tools that he has. Right. But you also can't begrudge me and you from treating him like what he was. He's a philosopher. You know, he's a professional speculator. So, absolutely. I mean, of course, philosophers, they can point out obvious facts just like anybody can, but. You also have to know when they're breaking out one of their pet theories, too. You don't just sit there and accept it because he's a great man. You have an argument, which is what they want you to do with them anyway. So, Mr. Davis, what would you say to, say, an evangelical who hasn't really thought about the Trinity, has been kind of intimidated away from the whole subject, and is just starting out? How would you advise them to proceed? I would say that 
you really just got to go back to the Bible. Remember to be conservative, to stick to what you know. Don't be afraid to ask questions, and don't be afraid to insist on actually seeing stuff proven from the Bible. People will want to give you bad explanations to things. People will want you to just accept their arguments sometimes without really establishing what they're saying well enough from the Bible for you to know that it's right. I'd say just have a healthy skepticism and a healthy criticism. Always trust God. Have faith, right? Faith is a good thing, but our faith needs to be in God and it needs to be in the Bible. It needs to be in what we know is actually trustworthy. We can't give that same sort of implicit faith to other sources to tradition or to favorite teachers uh, without really risking a lot, I think. Um, we, we risk so much when we do that. So, so stick to the Bible and uh, remember that a Christian is somebody who follows Jesus. If you have to explain away something Jesus said to fit with your view, let that be a red flag. The Bible is the biggest thing, and if, if, uh, if you're somebody who likes church history or history and you're able to and you want to read the fathers, the fathers are a really helpful resource as well. You know, obviously I wouldn't say trust everything you read. You can't. They all disagree with each other. But uh, it's really helpful for seeing the development of things and also just for being able to see with your own eyes that there were not people who believed in a triune God in the first and second and third century. It's, it's a novel view. And you should be distrustful of novel views. You know, the faith was handed down once for all. The faith once delivered to the saints in Jude, right? You know, make every effort to make sure that you have that same faith, and that that if you were able to go back to those churches and to the up, you know, if you were able to go to church with the apostles, that they'd say you have the same faith we do. Uh, that it's not something that they couldn't have known because it's a later development, and that's really important. Well, Mr. Davis, thanks for talking with us. Thanks for having me. This week's thinking music has been the track Improvisation on Friday by Alex. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinities Podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode, or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.